the, the session by giving you some information about emotions and feelings, because this is what um, I'm going to mute everybody. Okay, so this is what we're dealing with. It's really not an intellectual thing. Uh, the, the experience of loss is very much visceral, right? It's very feeling and emotion, emotional based. And unfortunately, growing up, we have not learned um, the, the, about emotions, about the truth of emotions and feelings accurately. We haven't learned how to uh, deal with it, how to express it, how to think of any kind of emotion and feelings. We've been, we learned from, you know, growing up from all around, from family, parents, from teachers, from friends, and usually, especially in the Western societies, it's all about be tough. Uh, don't look at it. Don't go there. Don't be, you know, don't be uh, so emotional. Don't cry. Don't, oh, it will pass. We get these kind of messages, right? And, and loss is not just the loss of a person or a loved one. We go through a myriad of losses from the get-go. You know, we may in the beginning of time, you know, we may have loved a, a and, and as I'm talking about these things, you may reflect back and see how you may resonate or relate to that. Um, that uh, you may have lost a toy and, and just really grieving over that loss and, and the mother or father, can, okay, come on, don't worry about it. You have all these other toys. You don't have to, you know, be so hung up on that, we'll get you another one, we'll get you another one, you know, so it's some messages like that. Or you may have lost your pet, or you may have uh, had some emotional, you know, experience at school and come home and you had a hard time and, and oh, the mother might say, oh, don't worry, sweetheart, come have some cookies and milk, you'll feel better, right? And so, so, constantly for lack of knowing nobody is really having the intention to minimize feelings and emotions but they don't know how we don't know how as human beings we we grow up uh, learning very little about our inner experience that's just all around uh, some cultures have more some cultures less western society is much more than that and also, people don't know what to do about it. When we get upset, or somebody even in your presence, you could think of that. When somebody gets upset, we don't know exactly what to do about it. You know, we uh, try to fix it right away, or try to distract ourselves right away, or try to um, get away from it. I mean, I remember when my son uh, passed away, uh, and the first year after, it was during the first year that I went back to, uh, I went to a monastery with, where he had stayed before he passed away. And uh, the first time I went there in that environment where, I, where he had been working in the kitchen, be with people, or, you know, uh, engage, I just not kind of pictured him being there. Oh my God, I collapsed. I collapsed, I, I sobbed and cried, and it was so, so intense. And, you know, in a monastery, you got to be peaceful, you got to be quiet, you got to be, right, you, you know, crying loud or uh, laughing loud or anything like that is, you know, you, you try not to do that. And so I remember that when that, when I became that intensely, you know, uh, emotional, it was as if you drop a sort of a, uh, a, a pebble or something into water and the ripples, the water moves away from the pebble. Everybody moved away. Everybody just like as if there was distance between me and the most friendly person I knew, you know, like 10 feet distance. And I'm in the middle of this, you know, this uh, floor sitting and crying. And I was just why that I was feeling that I was thinking why why what's going on with with the friend who drove me here why isn't he coming to hold me hug me or something and nobody did and so 
And then finally a Thai woman who was there, she came, she ran over, I didn't know her, she held me and what is it, what is it, what is it? And so I said, oh, where is so-and-so? They took me to so-and-so and even my, my teacher, my spiritual teacher, who is so incredibly compassionate, oh my God, this man is just unbelievably beautiful as enlightened as one can be, you know, in this realm. When he saw me crying, he started laughing, you know, laughing off. He said, well, of course, that's his, that's his go-to kind of a thing. But again, these messages of not now or, or change or look at you it's not appropriate or whatever and the, i also the other part of this that i'm writing a book about this too that we as human beings we have to learn how to be a human how to do anything and everything and at the end of the day the interpretation of it is up to us whatever we learn all the messages all the ways that people talk to us or respond to us we take it and interpret it and make it our own. So the accuracy or the effectiveness of any kind of, you know, uh, skill that we, le we learn is very unreliable. First, the one who gives us the message may not know it the best, chances are. Second, we take it and, you know, interpret it it's like a second hand, third hand, fifth hand, hundred thousand hand, right? Uh, message that we take it on and we interpret it. And so, um, so we get stuck, just like uh, Margaret, I believe was saying that feeling stuck because we're going the wrong way about it. So I want this session for you to be very much educational about uh, why we get stuck and also finding some ways to get out of it and opening. Again, it's a very short period of time for us to cover all these things. And I'm hoping that you can be present with it and uh, take away what you can. And then I'll give you the name of a book that, that I found very, 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 very informative, very educational, very effective. And so you can continue on your own working on it. Um, so now I'm just going to um, read you some of these. Actually, the book is, uh, I'll show you the book. It's Grief Recovery. Uh, when I lost my son and I was grieving, people gave me books that I did not read. That I did not read. I was so in way too much pain to even look at them. Uh, I remember one I opened, the moment I opened that one and I read two sentences, it was saying something that I did not resonate with. It was talking about the emotion in a way that I was like, no way, no way, they don't get it, right? That feeling of they don't get it. Nobody gets me the way I feel right now. Nobody gets me. So uh, I'm going to back up again because we started a little late. People came in a little late. I didn't, um, I skipped telling you about myself. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a um, mindfulness practitioner um, a good amount of time, many years now. And a uh, mindfulness teacher I teach for UCLA. And also I, I do training for um, executives, uh, you know, corporate world. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people. And basically the heart of my work is to understand the human nature in, in its most accurate way possible, you know? So for me, my talent is to learn these things, put them to application, test them out, see the results of them, 
verify the result from my own personal experience and then find ways to teach them to others in a way that's effective for other people. Um, you can read my bio on you know, LinkedIn or other places. So I'm not a grief expert, <laughs> you know, but from all of my trainings that I've done and I've received and I've worked with and my own personal grief, I feel that it's necessary, you know, for people to understand what's going on. So the first thing is we do not understand emotions. Emotions are energy in motion. They flow through us and they pass through us. Now, people say, let it pass. Mindfulness teachers, you know, let the emotion come and pass. However, the emotion of loss particularly is very different, particularly loss. So this could be loss of divorce, right? Because of divorce, it could be loss of financials. It could be loss of relationship, loss of, of course, loved ones that, that pass away, right? And so these types of emotions, they do have a particular uh, reason and that, that we'll get to and we will work on as much as possible right now, okay? So um, the messages that we get in the, from the get-go of our, um, you know, growing up, go wash your face and, you know, get on with it or go cry in your room until you're done and then when you're done, come out, you know? <laughs> or, uh, uh, or it's okay, you'll be fine. Or, or even when you've lost your loved one, people say, oh, she, he wouldn't want you to be unhappy. He wants you to be happy, right? I mean, when I hear that, um, I felt like, you know, when I fall into the grief, the intense hurricane of emotions, and someone says to me, Oh, your son wants you to be happy. I almost want to say, F him, right? It's not about him. I am, I am in pain right now, right? Don't tell me what he wants. He's gone, <laughs> right? And, and so, so this is pe because people don't know what to do. It's like, oh, God wants him. Oh, for God's sake. It's like, why the hell would God want to take my child away from me? What does God want with, you know, irrational things or intellectualizing or, you know, cognitive words, rationalizing emotions. So one thing you could learn is that about any emotion, you have to speak emotion to emotion and ration to ration. It's like different channels, right? And it doesn't work. So if you feel that it doesn't, the things you hear in that line of thing, thoughts, it doesn't work. Yeah, because it doesn't work. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with grieving for myself. Uh, the most, I believe, the, the most important loss of my life were two, actually. The first loss of my life was my grandmother, who was the backbone of me, who was the most incredible, you know, life source for me. And the second most important was my son. In between, my father also passed away. And then since I, I actually was taking an inventory of this losses that I realized I have lost nine very significant people in my life, nine of them. And so, but it doesn't start from losing people and it doesn't end with losing people. Loss is a learned emotion we learn from our environment how to feel about loss. And most often it's so inaccurate that it doesn't feel right that we get stuck with it. 
So I want to give you about five minutes or so to write down, make a, a kind of journal about these types of messages growing up you heard that that said deal with it or don't worry about it or maybe you you know eat this thing and you'll feel better or yeah she wouldn't want you to be unhappy or uh, anything from childhood till now we please take about five minutes i hope you have pen and paper with you and sort of put down quickly you know uh, things that you could remember and I'll um, I'll read as you write I'll maybe just kind of you know kind of like don't feel bad or or messages like you go and do this alone be by yourself right go to your room or uh, I mean, you could see even from your reactions, you may be in a relationship where you, when you, every time you get upset, you get in the car and you go away, <laughs> you know, just be by yourself. So it's, these are behaviors that we have learned from messages we got from growing up in churches, in schools, with friends, with family, with all that. So I'll, I'll be quiet and see what shows up for you. It doesn't have to be perfect, it's a practice. I think, okay, good. So I wanna make a couple of comments. Yes, the idea that if you don't express it, it means it doesn't exist, right? You don't, you don't say it, you don't cry, we don't talk about it, then it doesn't exist outside, right, in the environment. But, it, <laughs> but obviously it is, exists inside us. And the more we don't talk about it, chances are the reason that we uh, stop feeling it are what? Are things that we substitute for it, the energy, we sort of what in this book he talks about energy relieving, like we may go on uh, into spirituality, you know, and to just to pick up those practices of, that you're talking about. Thinking about um, death is part of birth. Birth and death are tied together. They, you you are born and you 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 know you die. And die, talking about death is taboo especially in this society, what we do is we constantly prepare ourselves for what? For not dying, for not getting injured, right? Call 911, learn CPR, don't walk on the ledge, don't go, you know, uh, uh, cut yourself. It's always trying to prevent from losing something. Don't, you know, don't expose your money. You're gonna, somebody's gonna rob you. Don't. But we are never told, okay, once you lose it, what do you do? How do you deal with it, right? And so I found uh, also, I did a lot of, I, you know, I practiced the Buddha's teachings as well. And I, and the idea of birth and death and you know, this is just the natural cycle has been very helpful. However, it still is not enough. Mm -hmm. When it's not enough, then the problem is we think it's our fault. Something wrong with you or me or something wrong with us that we can't get it. Can't you get it? Can't you see there's death everywhere? People are dying all the time. Can't you get it? So it's not that, and I will get to what the grief is all about and how to you know, go about it. But first I wanna ask for us really talk about what's the problem? What is the problem that, that we are stuck with, right? So <clears throat> these thoughts about uh, time will heal. Um, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. If you think about, okay, all beings die. So, you know, that's part of death. If you, God, you know, will keep you safe or, and some people, even in the spiritual realm, they may become, 
hateful towards their God. It's like, how the hell lose trust, right? Well, how did you, why did you take my beloved or so, right? Or become extra trusting or clinging to the spiritual or the religion or the God for more relief. Now, this is not to minimize that, to, to negate any, you know, helpfulness of that, but realizing the fact that we are still, or even from day one, from day one, I love this book because it says, when you get injured in any other way physically, you take care of it from day one, when it's really visible, right? And emotions that don't have to wait. Grief and loss doesn't have to wait. We can start immediately, actually, <clears throat> which I'm very grateful about. So the other thing is that, yes, the energy relieving things we do, we distract ourselves, we work too hard, we go exercise a lot, we go running into the, you know, we go, uh, we eat a lot right? What can we do? It's painful. I mean, for none of it should anybody ever blame themselves for none of it, right? Or sometimes we lash out, we misplace or displace actually our uh, grief and loss and pain onto somebody else, onto our partners, onto, um, you know, in a different direction. So that's another thing I'd like for you to, um, uh, to reflect on. I'm going to put you in, in breakout room this time and have you talk about how have you noticed yourself choosing something else, something to do to relieve the pain and has it fundamentally worked or just temporarily worked? Okay. So... I'm going, I'm sorry. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Breakout rooms, where are you? <laughs> Breakout rooms. And we have 11 people right now. Um, five. So I'll give you about 10 minutes. And what i like for you to do is, is not a, mon a conversation. It's about the person. Jennifer, are you saying something? No, you're not talking to me. Okay. Both of my daughters are here with me because we okay. have all suffered a loss. So I was talking yeah. to them, wanted them to be quiet so I can hear what you want us to talk about in the breakout room. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, yes. That's good. That's good they're here. <laughs> they can learn because we need to learn. Yeah, education is most important. So think about ways that you distract yourself or, you know, it's pain, pain. What are we going to do? Pain is pain. Uh, food, alcohol, exercise, uh, isolation, avoidance, not talk about it. I don't want to see the pictures. I don't want to, you know, see the videos. I don't want to, whatever else you do. Okay. So I'll give you about 10 minutes. Please, when you're listening, you may cry or laugh, but uh, try not to speak when you're listening. Okay, so this is being mindful, aware, and present for the other person. When the person who is talking, you can express your emotions as you're talking. And if you get stuck with continuing, try to come back to the, to the topic at hand rather than uh, extrapolating or, you know, expanding so much out of the, I mean, the, do your best. So Take about 10 minutes to talk about that. How do you distract yourself from the pain? <laughs> thank you, Ballwinder, for sharing. We're now in the main group. So thank you for your time. Thank yeah. you. Okay, good. Okay. Who else who hasn't said anything wants to? Okay, I'll share. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, I think that I have used in the last few years to really paint um, classes and retreats with Manage, first of all, and private sessions. I've done all of that in the last few years. That has been very, very helpful. Um, 
I have read and gone to two day long workshops and a weekend retreat by David Kessler, who is a, um, he's a grief expert, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, exercise, being in nature, being around water at the beach. I was just at the beach yesterday. I have a big park with a lake by my house. I spend a lot of time there. That's very, very helpful. Um, meditation and mindfulness. Um, um, being, sometimes I feel like being around other people is, is what I need. And when I feel that, I reach out and, and I spend time with, with friends, but I'm careful about it. I'm very careful about being with friends that I know are not going to, to trigger me, people that are, you know, just the right people at the right time. And, uh, and sometimes I feel like being by myself. So even if, so I honor, I honor that. I honor what I need. Um, uh, what else? I know that recently what has helped to relieve the pain is to ask my brother's friends, um, who's 54 and, you know, one part of our life we were close. And, and I know some parts of his, his life, um, the home life, but I like to listen to anecdotes, things that his friends remember, you know, his jokes, his humor, how he was around people because he was different with his friends than he, he was with us. And they often have um, happier memories. So that's been, I, I love going back and hearing about my father or my mother who, who is alive, but she has Alzheimer's. But I find that if I ask their friends or their family members, I get a whole other, happier, less emotional um, um, rendition of them. So that, that has helped tremendously recently. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So what she's talking about is helping to heal herself, doing things that are directly meant to heal oneself. What I was talking about is what are you doing not to feel the pain? Right? right. Avoid the... No, no, it's okay. Actually, I'm going to address what you said. It's a very good um, a good example, too. So, so uh, anything else you want to... Anybody wants to say anything you do that... Walter, are you able to... Ah, oh, no, we cannot hear you. Does anybody else hear him? No, we can't hear you. Something about you. Maybe you want to take put it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So Balwinder put a question in there: Becoming spiritual or religious after loss does it help? Does it provide extra relief? Um, see, what we want to learn, and I'm. Uh, hoping to learn to for you to learn is or to begin begin the process is to complete the pain and be free of it not to get relief that's what we're talking about things we do to get relief because we don't know how to be done with it you know, how to be done with it. And so we want to learn how to, because we are here, we are a full human being and deserve to live our life fully. And we can live it fully, given that we will continue to lose. This is not a one-time deal or, you know, we, that's it. So you're going to continue experiencing loss loss of anything and everything. And that's part of our uh, human existence until we are the one who others feel the loss of us, right? <laughs> so learning what to do about loss, just like when we learn what to do about preventing loss, right? Preventing to get sick, preventing. Preventative now is a big business around the world, right? health prevention and uh, age prevention and beauty loss prevention. And oh my God, it's a multi-billion dollar business, right? But nobody says when you have lost it, how do you do? What do you do? How do you feel? Uh, how do you live with it? So um, I'm going to get, uh, so there, there is a couple of texts here. Averting, Glenn, averting feeling of grief is mixed with self-comforting. 
uh, my creating healthy meals focus food focused right okay uh, I used to Maria I used to visit Bulgaria to spend time with my mom I have not been in Bulgaria for 10 years yeah so that's a loss too right feel like it is in my DNA that we will sense each other in in the afterlife oh yes party <laughs> Yeah, so shopping, yes, shopping, yes. So another thing, one thing that I personally discovered through my mindful awareness and self-compassion practice was that grief, especially of, um, of the blood type, probably my grief of my child, my son passed away when he was 26 years old. And in his prime time of uh, setting a life that, that would be very happy, fulfilled, he had become, because of pain, uh, he fell, and because of pain, he became hooked on those opioids. And so finally, he gave life for it because, you know, that's where it leads. And so going through the hurricanes and tsunamis of pain, First of all, the first year I was like, honestly, now I could say as if I had COVID or something, the entire year or something, it was just not go away. The only way that I felt relief was uh, when I was teaching, my students would say, manager, you're so good. You're so happy. You're so bright. You should teach every night. We'll come to your class, you know, out of compassion, they would, <laughs> they would try to, but Going through it, I, I, I really realized something very deeply, which was, this is not bonding between me and my child. This is not psychological. This is physiological. This is neurological. This is my every cell in my body has lost. It's like every cell in my brain is objecting, has lost this thing, you know, because of this connection, this, this blood relation, because of this, my, the last time I, on Mother's Day, when I, oh my goodness, I got hit with this tsunami of emotions. I felt like, it's like my mindset wanted to explain, it must be my productive, reproductive system. You know, it's like saying, I don't care that you're peaceful and happy, I am not, you know because my mind could be peaceful. I'm, uh, you know, happy about my, my own life. So it's, there is a lot going on. Also, our brain is designed in a way that would learn things for us and put us on autopilot. So we don't have to worry about the brain will take care of it. So if the brain learns something wrong, that's what we're going to do what we call habits, you know, that I can't not do it. It's because we have neural pathways in our brain that's determined to do them these ways, the whatever ways we learn anything to do, right? And so, so we have that to deal with too, right? Now, in this, um, in this perspective, there are, I'm sure, many, many, many different ways people offer for grief recovery. One thing that um, these MDs, Grief Recovery Book, they have, and I'll put the name in the email and in the chat afterwards, they have uh, brought to attention, which I have really experienced to be truth, is that those five stages of grief, the stages of grief, they don't exist. They're not true. Because each of us, each loss we have, is very individual and is relationship based. You have a certain relationship with this loss that is not exactly the same as this other loss, right? So they explain that even when you talk about anger, for example, as a stage, it's not, it's not anger because the, the feeling of anger for loss, but it could be because of the circumstance around the loss 
Maybe because, for example, I felt a lot of anger towards my grandmother. It would come up, and I loved her. She was the the the, she was the angel of my life. My anger towards her was, "You were so wise. You were so kind. You never told me you're gonna die. You should have told me, right?" So it wasn't that the 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 it wasn't directly because of the loss, but it was at her, you know, right? Towards like, oh, you should have done this. It's a relationship thing, right? So again, time is of essence. So I'm kind of cutting some pieces so we could get there. Um, if you had, when you go home and you could do this, if you did a timeline, of what you have lost. You know, so as a child, you lost a toy, you lost a pet, you lost, you know, you lost a friend growing up, you lost your, you know, neighbor, you lost, 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 lost. And then if you were to look at all these losses, you'll see that the way you experienced had to do with the relationship you had with this thing or person, and what they told you, what others told you how to feel, what to do, get away, get, get over it. Uh, you know, like for me, when I lost my, you know, my, my son, my, my own sisters who just loved him to death from childhood, they would, they, one of them would say, I only think about the good stuff. You know, so before we cremated him, none of my family members, not even his father came to see him. His corpse, they couldn't, they couldn't handle it. They, everybody says, oh, I want to remember him the same way. And to me, it was such a betrayal. Like, oh my God, how can you love only one way? The picture of this person the perfect way, but not the, so that was, that was my turmoil to, to deal with this, right? But none of it is helpful. None of it is helpful. So yeah, feeling abandoned by the deceased. So, so we get to the relationship. I want to take you there. And I was thinking actually before this session that, oh my God, two hours, how are they going to, how am I going to bring this home? <laughs> and I thought, you know what, I'm going to make an offering. The Sunday, the 13th, I'm doing a day long retreat. You all think about it. If you want to, I would be willing to convert that retreat into a day of grief recovery retreat. And we go through all these little by little by little, slowly all day with meditation, with peacefulness, with, you know. So I'm just throwing that out. It's a normal, regular retreat, but I, if there are enough people to want to do that, I can convert it. So grief, according to these authors, is an emotional incompleteness. Simple. And this is in relation to the thing you have lost or person you have lost. It's not complete. Completeness, because you could think of it. Afterwards, you think of these thoughts come to you like, oh my God, I should have said that. Oh my God, why did I say that? Oh my God, how could I, you know, and it's like the more you think about it, it's done. There is nothing you could do. It's a, it's a relationship that could be, I hated you, I, I, you know, that you would not want to go there. Usually we want to remember either the, all the good stuff or all the bad stuff. And then, then we don't know even what to do with it, right? when we remember these things. So emotional incompleteness is the cause of our pain. And until we complete that, we cannot move on. Okay. I 
And so if you think about it, um, I was thinking about this when, you know, on LinkedIn, when I sometimes, when I'm active on LinkedIn, I see somebody messaging me or I message somebody and oh my God, above this message, I see my son's note, the son that I lost, that he wrote to this person four years ago, five years ago, talking about my business and how brilliantly he, he wrote. It just breaks my heart when I see it. Why it breaks my heart? Because I remember that I did not acknowledge him for this. The thought occurs to me that, oh my God, I didn't know he was doing all this work. I didn't even know he was doing all this work. He was working with me. He was in the office. He had goals to take care of, you know, uh, people to reach out to. It was a general kind of a duty. But the one by one by one things that he did, I didn't know. To, I didn't know. And my heart would break because of that, that I did not tell him. I may, oh my God, what an amazing thing he wrote. Not to blame myself, right? Because we, my goodness, the lives we live, we can't pay, pay attention to every hundred thousand things in our life. But that is the example of incomplete emotional relationship that now we can actually work on completing so we can move on, right? Or I remember him saying, uh, one time he said, mom, you never encourage me, you know, right? So I'm a mom, he's working for me. And he had the habit of this, this opioid thing. So I was always worried and afraid for his life. So I would be more so directing him to do things better, to, to be attentive, to not do something that would harm him, right? rather than showing interest in things that he does that are very well done. As mothers, as family, we do this. With our spouses, we do this. With our friends, we do this. With people we care about, we think if we, if we help them be on top of the problems, then this way we love them and, and they will be on top of the problem. Right. So I remember that he one time he said, Mom, you never encourage me. And my heart breaks. Oh my God, I want to tell him, Oh my God, sweetheart. I am so sorry. I, you know, that I wasn't in this way or the other way. Right. Or another thing could be that they did something wrong. And we never forgave them for it. We never let go of that pain. So these are the three things we could do to close that emotional, to complete the emotions. Before I tell you what the three things is uh, and go, you know, continue, I want to stop and see what you all are thinking. what occurs to you. Um, I think um, what I'm interested in what you were saying, Manaji, is um, right after my losses, I did this uh, course and they were talking a lot about the five stages of grief or five stages. And I, um, I'm so glad that you uh, were talking of, are talking about this right now because I felt so, um, how, what is the right way of saying it? I felt as if I wasn't processing it the correct way because I find myself not in a circular motion of this experience 
and um, so I felt like um, I don't know. Uh, it's like your, it's for your fault, right? You felt like it's your fault. Yeah, I felt like it was a failure in my in in my um, how it was processing things. How you were feeling? Yeah. Why are you feeling this way? You should be feeling this other way. <laughs> yeah. So the book explains that those five stages, the person who came up with it was the stages of getting a diagnosis for death. If you got diagnosed that you got cancer or something, for example, these are what a person could go through, anger, depression, uh, avoidance, guilt, these things like that. And then it's been widely taken and tried to superimpose it on the actual loss. And it doesn't work. I remember going to a therapist, actually, in between all this, and she told me about that. I didn't know about it. She said, Google. She even didn't explain it herself. She said, Google the five stages of loss. A therapist. And so I Googled it. And I thought, it, says, Be it does not match me. It doesn't match my experience. And then she says, oh, well, because... So I went back and I explained. She says, oh, well, because it, it comes and goes. You go in and out of it. And... And so when is the end of this? It's like a, yes, a natural cycle, but grief is a very natural uh, reaction, emotional reaction to loss. And how to sort of move through and end it is not through thinking that there are set way that everybody standard way of feeling about it it's not real it's not true it is very individual it is very uh unique pair relationship right so if you think about it if for example your gardener died and gardener you know you don't you don't feel as intensely abandoned or you know emotional as you lost your child or, or father or something but then you may think oh gosh i should have given him more money you know right <laughs> or or i should have, oh i didn't pay the last bill to him or something oh damn that's terrible right so it's an emotional or it's an incompleteness of the relationship okay so i uh, Liana, Lian, are you saying something? You're muted. If you could unmute yourself. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Um, I agree with so many things that you say. I just think personally for me, um, we lost our 16 year old son, October the 6th last year, mm. that's nearly eight months and it was completely unexpected. Yeah. And um, what you said earlier, I'm still here and he's not here anymore. So what am I doing here? Oh. So that the carpet was completely ripped under from underneath me. So. And I'm still wondering, you know, who decided who's living and who's dying? And if I was religious, I was so angry. Yes. I do not want to think about God or the source of life of, because I'm so angry that there was no discussion, no negotiation, no warning. And that's where I'm stuck. Yeah. So and, and that's ex exactly that incompleteness of my grief or my emotions. I fully agree with you there. It's true. But, but it goes even a bit deeper of an existential crisis. Yes. Yes. Yes, sweetheart. Look, I remember the first month I fainted every day. 35 days. My brain couldn't handle it. And I remember friends would come, family would come and 
one time they came and took me to restaurant to have lunch. Get me out of the house, do something, do something, right? And I'm sitting there, we ordered lunch. And I said to my friend, really honestly, genuinely, I said, I'm sorry, why are you alive? Why are these people alive? Why is anybody alive? It made mm -hmm. so, it was so nonsense, right? Like mm -hmm. your uh, child, son, my son too, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, just so suddenly. It was like, who decided that when a child dies, the mother should be left behind? it's a bad system horrible system a mother and child should die together right mm -hmm. because it's confusing it's it's the, the more the i mean right so so we are dealing with multi-layers of realities right this thing mm -hmm. that i am the the the, the, mm -hmm. the essence of me is it, it it's my identity the owner of this child, the bearer of this child, the, the creator of this child, the responsible person for this mm -hmm. child. I, I should have protected him, mm -hmm. right? I think I should have been more patient. I should have, I should have, I should have. And the problem is none of it is helpful and time will not be the healer. So there is physical experience, physiological experience. One thing aside from completing emotion that was extremely helpful for me is to completely feel, feel those emotions whenever they showed up. And then my heart of compassion would open. My own heart would say, no, for me, right? In that moment, for me, no. No, I should not be feeling this pain. Why should I feel this pain? I, you know, it's like, I don't want to, not in a avoidance, but in a, I need to do something about this. This is not okay. I will not be, I made a vow. I will not be the mother who is done for life. I will not be in 20 years saying, having no no light in my eyes you know no hope for my happiness that is unacceptable so being aware and mindful of your body feeling it expressing it the most important thing before we go to the relationship thing for us is to be able to express the grief the pain finding some kind, compassionate people who are not going to try to fix it, but they will hear you cry it out or just cry it out, you know? I mean, I learned that it was very helpful for me to reach out to people and say, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm going to and cry, no matter what they're saying, just cry, you know? I mean, on Mother's Day, I called, my mother called, I, I was just dying. I said, mom, I cannot be happy. I will not be happy. I will not be happy today, right? How dare anybody doesn't think about mothers who have lost a child and say, mother, happy Mother's Day, <laughs> you know? So, so these emotions are fine. They're very normal. We have to have them. We have to express them. We have to be with them. And then from a heart of kindness, like what Maria said, try to bring comfort to ourselves. But even that, it is not enough. It is not the end. It doesn't end the grief, right? We keep on bringing comfort to ourselves and keep realizing it deep inside, there is that hole, nobody gets it. There is that hope. Yes, I believe me, I swear to God, I know I am made up of all the elements and the elements get all, you know, um, brought, break down into earth and water and wind and air and, you know, all that. I know it, believe me, but still there is a hole in the heart, right? Because there is that incomplete thing with the person we lost, okay?
Do, do anybody, does anybody need a break? Five minutes break? Or should we continue? Okay. So originally I had uh, posted this uh, workshop to be three hours. We changed it to two hours because people said it's I don't know, a long weekend, whatever, whatever. Uh, if you're willing and wanting to stay longer, I can stay another half hour longer. We can, we'll see when we get there. So there are three areas that we can communicate with the one we have lost. One area is for having a sort of a space for apologies, to make apologies for whatever we think that we might have done wrongly or not done properly. One area is to forgive. And forgiveness, some people say, I cannot forgive. Well, you can try to see what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is giving up the hope for a different past. For the past to be different or better than it was. It's like giving that hope up and from the perspective of our practice of mindfulness, giving up the pain of it. Not the action, not the, you know, whatever was done, not none of that, but giving up the pain of carrying with us. Right. And um, Oh yeah, and the third one is significant emotional statements, making emotional statements, significant emotional statements. So uh, if you would take about five minutes and write down just anything that just occurs to you right now, and we could you could look at it more deeply later on, what would be something that you might if you had a chance to say to your loved one who's passed away that you are sorry about, you'd like to, an apology is not always um, admitting guilt or admitting fault. It's about expressing that I feel bad for such and such thing I did or didn't do. Do you know what I mean? Because some people, take it the wrong way is not that admittance of guilt but expression of feeling bad about something you did do or didn't do did say or didn't say so take about five minutes and jot something down Just keep an open mind that if it was a case where you were um, mistreated by this person or anything like that, um, that is not to be dismissed or minimized. But it's a whole big relationship, a complex relationship that doesn't end just to that one part. There's so many other parts.
Okay. So next, I want you to write some statements that would be sort of emotional statements that you want to express, such as, you know, I loved you, or I was ashamed of you, or I, I you know, I was proud of you. Some, some very important emotional statements. Could be positive or negative. I appreciated the time we spent together. Or appreciate all the sacrifices you made. Or when you didn't listen to me, I felt dismissed. I felt overwhelmed. Or So now I'm going to, about the forgiveness part, I'm going to read um, his description. He says, forgiveness is giving up the hope of a different or a better yesterday. Right. It's one of the least understood concepts in the world. Most people seem to convert the word forgive into the word condone. The definition in the Webster's is, um, it says to ease, to feel resentment against, to ease, to feel, I'm sorry, to cease to feel resentment against, right? But condone is to treat as if trivial or harmless or not important. So we're not condoning, but we ease the resentment towards. Right? And this is really for our own benefit. When you forgive somebody, it's to the benefit of the forgiver. The one who gives forgiveness, first of all, they benefit me because they don't have to carry this hope, this impossible hope, you know. Uh, so he says, you cannot feel forgiveness until you do it. Many people say, I can't forgive him. I don't feel it. To which we say, of course not. You cannot feel something you have not done. A feeling of forgiveness can result only from the action of verbalizing the forgiveness. So forgiveness is an action, is not a feeling. Forgiveness is giving up the resentment you hold against another. You may need to forgive them for something they actually did. I forgive you for ruining my birthday party or for something they did not do. I forgive you for not attending my graduation. There is a strange expression, I can forgive, but I can't forget. It mixes two separate ideas that are not directly connected. Imagine that you were horribly beaten over many years. It is not even vaguely possible to forget those incidents. The implication of I can forgive, but I cannot forget is that since I cannot forget, I will not forgive. But ask yourself, who stays in the jail? Who continues to resent and shut down his or her own mind, body, and heart? Whose life is limited by the lack of forgiveness? 
we're often asked whether in dealing with living people, it is appropriate to forgive someone in, uh, in person or response to, uh, and the response is no, 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 no. An unsolicited statement of forgiveness is almost always perceived as an attack. <laughs> if you say, I forgive you, meaning I had something against you, now I, you know, I forgive you. So this is a uh, thing about forgiveness. So uh, many people ask others to forgive them. We think this is a very in, incorrect communication. In fact, when you ask for forgiveness, you are manipulating. You are asking the other person to do something that you need to do. And when you ask someone who has died to forgive you, you're asking a dead person to take an action. Spiritual beliefs aside, it is clear that you need to take an action, not ask someone else to do it for you. If you're asking for forgiveness, you are really trying to apologize for something you have said or done. Don't try, do it. Don't ask for forgiveness, make the apology. Yeah. So uh, go ahead and um, see if there are any couple of things or a few things that comes to you that you would like to ask uh, or either do the forgiving towards the loved one that has passed away or ask them for forgiveness. And think about it. If you're asking them for forgiveness, it's really an apology. I'm sorry I did this. They don't need to forgive you or you know, they don't need to say, okay, I, I hear you. It's your own sort of awareness of it, acknowledgement of it. And then when you have this list done, I'd like for you to write a letter to this person. Write the letter. And the letter would be like, let's say is to your dad. Dear dad, I have been discovering, I have been looking at our relationship and discovering some things that are incomplete, some emotional, emotional ex, uh, experiences that are incomplete. And I'd like to say, I'd like to express. So start by saying, dear whoever, I've been reviewing our relationship and have discovered some things I want to say. And so you could list it. I, I, I appreciate for all these things. I, and these are your emotional statements. I, uh, when you did such and such, it made me feel this way and that way. I feel this, I feel that, I felt this, I felt that. Because you see, we don't get a chance to do all this, right? We postpone, we constantly table things we wanna say to other people. Another day, another week, next time. They won't get it anyway. Why should I say it, right? So now it's a, it's an internal. And so this is a, um, useful that we share with somebody else who is, who we can, you know, we feel good about sharing with this other person. So I see we have two minutes on the clock. Who has to get off at 12 o'clock? Raise your hand. Must. Okay. The rest of you can stay. So what I want to do is to give you, okay, Jennifer, too. whoever can stay, I'd like to give you a chance to write that letter. It doesn't have to be a perfect, complete letter, but a draft. And then I'm going to ask, put you in breakout rooms for you to read it to each other, to be that listening to be the person who is kind and, oh, and present and willing to hear. Would you like to do that? I think it could be helpful. Okay, yeah. 
So take about, I don't know, five, seven minutes to write your letter. And then I'll put you in breakout rooms so we can. Again, your letter starts with dear so-and-so. I've been reviewing our relationship and have discovered some things I want to say. And then three areas, some things you want to apologize for, some things you want to forgive them for, and some emotional statements you want to make to them. So I will give you about six, seven, seven minutes. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll ring the bell in seven minutes, okay? And I'm gonna put my camera and 